Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to your National Conference of State Legislators conference call. Today's topic, Charter School Networks. Does profit status matter? All lines have been placed on a listen-only mode, and the floor will be open for your questions and comments following the presentation. If you would like to submit a question at any time during the webinar, you may use the chat box located on the lower right-hand side of your screen. Simply type your message into the box and click on the Send button. We will not be taking live questions for this conference, so make sure all questions you have are submitted through the chat. If you should require assistance throughout the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad to reach a live operator. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to your host, Josh Cunningham. Josh, the floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, again, this webinar is titled Charter School Networks, Does Profit Status Matter? My name is Josh Cunningham. And I'm a policy specialist at the National Conference of State Legislatures, and I oversee our work on school choice policy. Um, I will be moderating this discussion today uh, with two, our two guest speakers. Donald Cohen uh, is the executive director of In the Public Interest, uh, which is an organization that researches privatization and re responsible contracting, uh, and they support more transparency in government contracting. They also operate a website called cashinginonkids.com, which provides information on the privatization of the public school system. Also with us today is Don Cooper, who is the Director of Government Relations uh, for National Heritage Academies, which is one of the largest for-profit charter management organizations in the country. They operate uh, 80 schools and serve uh, over 50,000 students nationwide. Uh, Don also serves on the Michigan Association of Public School Academies Board of Directors. I want to start off before we get to our speakers uh, with some basic background uh, information on this subject. Um, and I'll start off by just explaining briefly uh, kind of who NCSL is if you're not familiar. Uh, we provide a number of services to all 50 state legislatures and U.S. territories. Um, and, and important for this conversation uh, is that we do not take any positions on state policy matters. So we do not have a position on this issue. Uh, we do not um, oppose or support charter schools in any way. We, 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 we are completely neutral. We're just here to provide information um, to state legislatures uh, and provide various perspectives and bring them together. So what is a charter school management organization? Uh, they're called different things, but for the purposes of this presentation, uh, when I say that, or when I say CMO, I'm grouping in all for-profit and non-profit organizations. And I will specify uh, when necessary which of the two I'm talking about. Um, but they have a lot of similarities, uh, both for-profits and non-profits. Um, and that's the most independently operated entities that contract with charter school boards. Um, and they provide uh, full operational management services to the school. They basically operate the school. Um, and that includes providing curriculum, administrative support, uh, staffing and faculty, uh, technology, et cetera. The funding for the the funding that they receive uh, comes from the charter school board's uh, per pupil revenue that it receives from uh, local state sources. So the, the management organization charges a, a service fee, not too dissimilar from what school districts uh, withhold from their, their public schools uh, for administrative costs. And lastly, they uh, both types of management organizations often manage multiple schools and utilize some sort of standard model so that if you were to go to any of the schools in their network, they generally would look uh, pretty similar. And I just wanted to briefly talk about kind of what, how many of these schools are there out there. So uh, there are about 20% of all charter schools um, that are operated by nonprofit CMOs. Um, and uh, compare that to about 12% that are operated by for-profit CMOs. That's about a third combined, about a third of all charter schools nationwide. That means that about two-thirds of all charter schools are actually freestanding, independently managed, not part of some sort of larger network. I have a couple maps here just showing the concentration of those schools. So those numbers I gave you were, were uh, nationwide, but if we look at how they um, are concentrated within states, you'll notice the darker the state uh, is on the map, 
the more of those uh, schools are in those states. So this first map is uh, showing the for-profit uh, or charter schools that are operated by for-profit CMOs. And then we also have a map here showing uh, charter schools that are operated by non-profit CMOs. Again, the concentration within states of those schools. And lastly, I just wanted to uh, show you kind of what the what the big companies look like. So uh, here I list the five largest for-profit CMOs. Um, and this is actually a couple years old as most recent data. Um, so this may have, the order may have changed a little bit. Um, but you'll see the top five uh, for-profit CMOs here and the number of charter schools that they, that they operate. And then here are the five largest non-profit CMOs. You'll notice uh, KIPP Foundation, uh, most people are familiar with KIPP charter schools, um, far away the largest uh, in the country. Uh, but you notice the others are a little bit smaller than, uh, their networks are a little bit smaller than what the for-profits were. So, um, you know, as far as the, the big companies, the for-profits tend to have a slightly larger network than the non-profits. So I want to then take us to um, our first speaker, which is going to be Don Cooper from National Heritage Academies. Josh, thanks for having me on today. Yeah, thanks, Don. Um, I wanted to just start off by asking you, why would a charter school want to contract with a management organization, whether it's for-profit or non-profit? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I really appreciate it. Uh, before we get into that, just a little bit of background about NHA that will help frame kind of the answer to the question. Uh, we're an organization, we were founded 20 years ago in 1995 in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, really with a vision of better educating more children. And since that time, we've grown to partnering with one charter school board in Grand Rapids, uh, to working with uh, 80 charter school boards across the country, serving just over 50,000 students. Uh, in terms of our student population, about two-thirds qualify for free reduced lunch. About two-thirds are, are classified as minorities. Uh, we operate schools in a diverse range of environments, from very urban environments to very suburban environments. And over that time, to your question, what we've really developed is, is, is a robust experience in a model that's proven to work in a variety of environments. So when a group might be interested in opening a charter school, you might have some applicants or some folks who are interested in serving on a board who, who have a really promising vision and a really promising, uh, really promising uh, some great goals on, how, uh, on where a school should be located, but need to bring in that expertise that an outside management organization can bring. And that can be either on the for-profit side or the not-for-profit side. So we really help that board take their vision of a successful charter school and, and make it a reality. Excellent. Well, why would why would a school take a for-profit management organization over a non-profit? Or what what added benefit is there to being a for-profit management organization? Sure. Okay. Uh, one of the one of the primary differences between for-profit and not-for-profit that tax status really relates to how we access capital. So if you're to come into one of our schools, and I'd be happy to invite anyone on the call to visit any of our schools, uh, you're going to see a lot of substantially similar things that you'll see in any great school across the country. Uh, teachers teaching, kids learning, you'll see gyms, you'll see hot lunch programs, everything that you'd expect to see in a school. The difference in that tax status really relates to how we access capital. Uh, we can go to different lending markets and different capital markets which makes it possible for us when we work with an applicant group to really put a robust investment up front in the development of the school. Uh, that investment looks like the construction of a new building uh, at our expense, not at taxpayer expenses. Uh, we also provide all of the startup costs associated with opening a new building. Uh, that's a contribution that we make. That's not a loan. So if, if at any point in time that board chooses to separate with us, that's our risk. That's our skin in the game. Uh, it doesn't fall on the taxpayers or it doesn't require a contribution for, from those who serve on the board. Without our for-profit tax status, we wouldn't be able to make that initial upfront investment. Great. Thank you for that. Can you address some of the criticism that for-profit CMOs um, get around, you know, people say that they're more concerned with expanding the number of schools than they are with um, maintaining a high quality of schools. How would you address that? Uh, that's, a, that's, a, 
that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I can't speak for everybody in the for-profit sector. I'll tell you what we do at NHA. Uh, over our company's history, we've normally grown at a rate somewhere of about four schools per year. And the reason we, and the reason we do that is because we want to have a very balanced growth pattern uh, that does a couple of things. First, our primary responsibility is always to the students and families that we're currently serving. So when we grow, we want to grow in a way that doesn't jeopardize the academic success of our current schools. Uh, we also want a growth pattern that, that, that helps uh, for those who are on wait lists and helps alleviate the wait lists over time where there's demonstrated demand. So in a lot of ways, it is kind of that balance uh, on, on our side of things. Uh, others may have a different approach on it, but we try to balance the two out. Uh, ultimately, our goal as a network is we want to we, we run great schools that get great results for kids over a long period of time. And the best way to do that is through that balanced approach. Great. I wanted to shift a little bit to um, some more specific policy issues. Um, you know, accountability is a huge issue uh, in state policy uh, around schools in general and especially around charter schools. To what extent should the, the CMO, the management organization, be held responsible for kind of the aggregate performance of their network of schools within a state? Sure. Um, you know, what we're seeing across the country is, is uh, authorizers, if you will, are becoming uh, more, uh, more uh, sophisticated in some ways in terms of how they look at quality of performance. So an authorizer right now will tend to look at when an applicant group will partner with a group like NHA or somebody else, will look at how well are you doing over time uh, in a specific state, across states, over years, things like that. And that authorizer will really make that judgment as to whether or not that school will go forward. And that's one means of accountability, both specifically for an individual school, but for the network. Have you proven yourself that you're able to grow over time uh, in a way that is in, in, in the best interest for kids? Uh, and those policies tend to be uh, equally applied across the for-profits and the not-for-profits. Uh, because ultimately it does get back to how do we how do we create an environment that facilitates uh, the opening of more great schools for kids. Great. One policy issue that has uh, the number of states have been really looking at is this idea of automatic closures of charter schools. So if a charter school is perform failing to uh, meet its its goals its performance goals um, and, and really performing poorly for you know three years or so. Mm -hmm. Uh, then, the, then they would be automatically closed, no questions asked. Does, does as a as a CMO and management organization, what what is your thoughts on that idea? Would that what what kind of consequences would that have for your organization? We uh, we operate and just to back up, we operate across nine states. So there's of course a variety of landscapes, variety of state laws. Many of the states that we operate in, including our home state of Michigan, does do have mandatory closure provisions put in state law. Uh, also equally important, many of the authorizing bodies that we uh, work with have mandatory closure provisions for not meeting the charter goals established in your contract. Um, ultimately, those decisions as to whether or not that should exist, that, that, that's a legislative decision. Uh, what we ask for if those are being established is that the goals be clear and consistent, that they be achievable, and that we prov be provided with enough runway in order to demonstrate the academic progress or proficiency that lawmakers or our authorizing bodies are asking us to, to do. So if we have a fair shot at it, uh, we believe that we can run a great school for kids over time, and we just want to make sure that the rules that, that we're uh, held to are clear and consistent. Okay. You know, there there are numerous anecdotes of uh, mm -hmm. charter school board members having close ties to the management organizations that end up operating the school. Mm -hmm. um, should states have stronger laws preventing uh, what, what might be a perceived conflict of interest there? Sure. Some, some states are trending in that direction. Authorizers, this is an area where authorizers also take a very active role as well. Uh, in, in our network, all of our boards that we work with are independent of NHA. So we go through great measures to make sure that there aren't real or perceived conflicts. Uh, each board works with an independent legal counsel, uh, has an independent auditor uh, to make sure that, that, the, that what we're doing, uh, that we're held to the terms of our charter contract and we're held to the terms of our management agreement, and we're delivering that value that taxpayers expect and the results that parents demand. Uh, authorizers are becoming uh, more uh, involved in this area as well by making sure that as, as board members are appointed to school boards, that they're vetted in a very robust way to make sure that there isn't that either real or perceived conflict. 
Uh, and again, that's that's something that you know we always function with that level of independence, uh, and policymakers are starting to uh, starting to consider that as well. Great. One one uh, area that, I, at least from my uh, conversations I've had with legislators and legislative staff around the country, um, an area of confusion uh, sometimes is around. Um, who is it that actually employs the, the faculty and administrators within a charter school that you operate? You know, in a, in a traditional public school, they would be employees of the district and employees of, of, of really of the state. Um, is that different for your schools? Uh, generally speaking, for us it is. So when a charter school board enters into a management agreement with us, that board is hiring us for the provision of the goods and services at that school. So we get hired by the board. Uh, we then staff the school, outfit the school, make sure that it has all the necessary resources and personnel. Uh, part of the conditions of our management contract is to make is to require us to manage the staff at that school. Um, how others do it, it, it varies based off of operator to operator. It varies based off of state to state. Uh, when there are instances where the board that we work for uh, has a staffing concern, we obviously work to address that in a way that's mutually agreeable for everybody. Uh, but to answer your question, at the end of the day, the employees are, are employees of NHA. Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, that was really great information. Um, I'm going to switch over to Donald here in just a minute. I do want to remind everyone um, that you can use your chat box on the right-hand side. If you have questions, feel free to put them in there. We'll address those uh, at the end. Um, so if you're thinking of a question, feel free to, to put it in there, uh, and we'll try and get to all of those um, before we finish. I want to switch gears over to uh, Donald Cohen, who again works for an organization called In the Public Interest. Donald, can you tell us a little bit about what your organization does? Uh, yeah, just briefly because you actually did a pretty good job of that early on. So we do research and policy development and look for best practices in, uh, you know, in the privatization of public services and assets, the contracting and, you know, and long-term leases and these of those same things, and you know, develop policy proposals and suggest you know ideas to help uh, do better contracting you know we, we do it across all sectors from criminal justice to education to infrastructure so we're you know we're a little bit at the 30,000 foot level and at some level uh, but you know in education we've have, we have been drilling down a whole lot more our website Great. is in the public and it's all up there excellent okay um, well I guess I'll start with asking you what would you say are the biggest concerns you think lawmakers should have about for-profit charter management organizations? Uh, sure, no, that's a good question. And, and just note, I want to make a couple of pre prefacing remarks. It could be that some of the things I mentioned have also, are also issues of not-for-profits, but it's, you know, because there's always some bleed in these things. So, but my intent is to try to stay focused on the for-profit. And the second is, I want to be very clear, we're not against business or, you know, because sometimes if you're against profit in a particular sector, you know, or if you have some negative things to say about that, that people think you're anti-business or what have you, that, that's not the case at all. So, um, so let me give you a few issues that I see, and I'm not going to name any names of individual companies, but they come from, you know, stories and news clips and audits and things like that. So first issue is transparency that many schools, many for-profits, um, I think this may be true of non-profits also, but many for-profits in particular refuse to provide pretty basic information about finances, about governance, about methods, about outcomes, about salaries. And it's not just that they, and, and there's for-profit reasons they use. One, they'll, they'll often say that a curriculum is a trade secret, right? So under the, exclu under the Freedom of Information Act exclusion, or they say it's proprietary or competitive information. Um, for example, there was, you know, just a couple of examples. One school was withheld some, you know, information from auditors in a particular state of how they allocated $1.6 million in back office costs, overhead costs. I'm sure they were all legitimate. But their rationale was that their allocation method was proprietary. This is the kind of information we, we, we would get from public entities, and remembering this is all public money, and, and we should be able to get, and legislators would certainly would want to get. Um, one, I'm I'm in Ohio right now, so that'll give you a hint. But there's a there's a board, you know, there's a there's a I, I keep saying EMO for Education Management Organization. That's just what's in my head. Um, refuse to give their own governing boards basic information about detailed accounting on expenditures, equipment, and 
etc., etc., etc. The case is in the court. The company's lost every round so far, and they're, they, they, what they say is, you know, once that once the money crosses from the public or the or the governing board representing the public to the private sector in a contract, then it's up to them to figure it out, and none of that information needs to be public. I mean, I'm making large statements. Um, there are we've seen uh, cases where for-profit charters r refuse to make student attrition rates public because they they say quote it's competitive information. Those are critical pieces of information for policymakers, for parents, for students. So that's one the issue of transparency. Um, another sort of broader issue is um, money diverted from classrooms. I mean, the most you know in the end we're talking about a, a teacher being in contact with a student. You know, through whatever mechanism. So that's the most valuable, and that's the, that's where as much of the resources should flow. So, money spent on television ads, money spent on advertising, sales teams, rate of return. You know, a higher rate of return on the capital that Don referred to, the early capital. Um, you know, is money that really we should be spending in classrooms. So, I think you know that's why I come down solidly on nonprofits. We want to put every dime to educate our kids. Um, and so that's you know. Number two. Number three is there. I think there is a question of dual loyalty. I mean, I don't think I don't know enough about NHA. I doubt it's a publicly held company. But you know, in the end, you have to figure out how to. If you are a publicly held company, you do have an oblig, you know, fiduciary obligation to your owners and your shareholders. It's legitimate and it's legal. And we really want institutions that have prime, you know, have one master, not two masters. Um, second thing we've seen. Um, you know, recruitment practices to make, you know, that, that are typical. These are sort of the incentive structures, recruitment practices and bonuses used by companies that have led to high pressure sales tax sales, you know, tactics to close the deals. And note that many companies won't disclose their salary structures. So it's really there's a belief here of mine, I think of many people, is that this really this is public good, it's public dollars, and it ought to, and it's the and it's the kind of information essential to be able to hold these publicly funded institutions accountable to our public purpose. Um, I want to address the conflict of interest as well. Um, Don mentioned one thing that I, this is, I know it's not a debate, but that more states are uh, doing aggressive conflict of interest pr provisions. There's at least one state that went the other direction, that's North Carolina, that actually just passed a bill allowing staff of for-profit management organizations to serve on the boards of public charters. And that's not necessarily, we don't know what other, you know, a, a right for corruption, but the conflicts of interest are very, very real. We've seen lots of cases where charter management companies, or for profit or not for profit, lease building space, lease land, for, or, uh, or 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 hire vendors that are connected by the people that are either owned by a company, you know, with the companies that they are buying or leasing the land from is owned by the same company that same person that owns the CMO. Or the same principles of the nonprofit EMO, and when you have two sides of folks on this, you know, when you are representing both sides of a transaction, um, you it is ripe for uh, I think it's too too strong to say corruption, but it's right to, for not good things to happen. Um, and and one thing that you lose when you go from public to private is you lose uh, the requirements for competitive bidding. They don't have to competitively bid. So and we've seen lots of cases and some scandals and some problems. And that, you know, you don't, I don't want to paint too broad a brush, but you have to have extraordinarily strong um, conflict of interest, firewalls like like Don was saying from NHA, making sure the incentive structures are there that put put the kids first. And I think there just are challenges to that when you're taking money out of the classroom uh, as opposed to putting it in. Great. Um... Public education is, by some estimates, as much as a $1 trillion industry, uh, with private companies making profits from virtually every aspect uh, of public schools, from testing to curriculum design to textbooks to technology. And the same can also be said about a lot of other areas of government, like transportation, healthcare, energy, defense. Why should, should for-profit CMOs be held to a, a different standard than those companies? Well, no. I mean, I'm not sure about defense. I don't have. A, I'm not. I'm not ready to compare that to the, to the defense industry. But I can. But I, but the question really to me, as I, as I'm hearing it, is, should for-profit CMOs be singled out and held to a, as high a standard as public institutions that provide the same service? Um, which are, you know, again, we're talking not about building an airplane for the defense industry or, you know, 
including, uh, or, you know, doing many other things, or you know, building a transit line or what have you. We're talking about educating kids. Um, it is one of our core, most vital, and valued public, you know, projects. And I think Don, you know, I'm sure Don would agree with that. So we don't think they should be held to a higher standard, but they should be held to the same high standard as any public institution. Hello. Yep. Somebody rang in. Oh, that. Never mind. That's probably my line. Um, you know, again, with transparency, with protection from conflict of interest and corruption, and the quality and accessibility of the educational experience. Now, if there is, I guess I would say if there's one way that for profits can be singled out, and this again may be applied to non for profits as well, is that one of the arguments is about this issue of closure, right? Um, is that one of the arguments I hear is that, well, if, you know, for profit charter, if people don't like it, if it's not functioning in the market, then parents can take their kids and go somewhere else and the charter will close. That's not a very good solution. It's an incredibly disruptive uh, uh, you know, solution for children, for families, you know, for, for that. So I would say there needs to be a higher standard in terms of what can happen if a school closes mid-year in that way. You know, I, I think it's picking, you know, we just have to remember that, you know, we're putting the, these private schools, we're using market mechanisms. Parents can move their kids to another school is the theory. But picking a school for your kids, I've got kids and grandkids, and it's not like going out to eat for dinner. If you don't like the food, you don't go back. If it's really bad, you walk out, but there's plenty of other restaurants, and it doesn't disrupt your life. So these, that kind of disruption has a bigger effect, and I think given the public purpose of educating our kids, I would actually hold them to a higher standard or a higher public solution or, or something like that. Great. Well, I I do want to push on that a little bit because, um, you know, charter schools, the school itself, at a minimum, is supposed to be held to the same accountability standards as other public schools. Uh, the charter school is uh, legally a, a public school. And so um, while the organization itself might not, uh, you know, have those requirements, the school that it operates still has to meet those academic uh, accountability requirements, meaning if it's low performing, um, you know, federal law says low performing for five years, you have to do, you have to intervene. Um, you should, you should, no, I get what you're saying. That's in terms of the, the law, right? But in terms, you know, some of this is state law as well, you know. But the, here's the here's the core issue there. Uh, you're not wrong, but here's the core issue. The core issue is oversight. Um, is the ability of an authorizer to both have the capacity and the skills to do to do high quality oversight? I mean, because everybody this is contracting, you know. If you know, to, to everybody knows, you contract for something and you don't watch carefully, bad things happen whether it's just incompetence or cutting corners or what have you. And, you know, we, we, again, I'm, not, I'm making blanket statements, but there's lots of authorizers and lots of charters. So this, these are like questions that a legislature would have to ask in each particular case. Um, there are authorizers that are woefully under-resourced and under-skilled um, to, to hold, uh, you know, to do that kind of oversight and often really unwilling to act, to, you know, to hold, to hold charters accountable. Um, and so... The issue is there's there's the legal standards, but there's also the question of scrutiny and the ability of whether that scrutiny can in fact occur. And the, you know we're talking when we talk about charters in, in both of these cases, nonprofit. Think about it. You've got a state government. You've got an authorizer. Could be any. Could be a school board. Could be a nonprofit. Could be a college. Then you've got a governing board of a school, and then you've got a CMO. So you now have a longer chain of actors and therefore more bureaucracy and more overhead right and so you have to do a lot better job when the dist when the the legislators who really are ultimately responsible to the people now go through three or four steps to get to the kids as opposed to one or two that's just from a management perspective the further you are the harder it is i have my last question for you is um you know you're saying these things, but in the end, if they can produce high-performing schools, is the quality of the school really what matters? I mean, does the profit status of the management organization or, or whether it's a man management organization or not have any bearing on whether they can provide a high-quality education? Well, uh, um, you know, you'd have to go to specific cases, right? It, 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 I would say it would depend. Um, if the charter 
management organization was sort of a high road company, which may, it sounds like NHA might very well be, where the CEO salaries aren't outrageous, where the marketing, where the you know the out of pocket, out of classroom expenses aren't outrageous, where they pay their teachers adequately, so they get high quality teachers and provide adequate training, and they're able to staff the, you know, and have a nurse on campus, and you know all the things that you need, and have good curriculum. But theoretically, there's nothing that could get in the way. There are good businesses and bad businesses. My point, sir. Not you know again conceptually when you're creating a structure, that what we should be doing is put figuring out how to put as much money into the classroom as possible because a high I mean again I've had children a high performing school is you know it, it, it means lots of things to lots of people right there's nobody in any school that wouldn't think God it'd be great if my kid, you know this school had some even smaller classes or my kid could even get more attention so. I'm not saying you throw money at everything, but I know. But but to, what we should be thinking about is how to maximize the amount of quality time, investment in quality time between a teacher and a student. And so, to the extent that they can do that, um, yeah, I'm sure they can do it. And I'm and I'm sure they can. I'm sure they're really good for-profit schools and really really bad you know really bad ones. And I'm sure the same thing is true of, of nonprofits as is true of, uh, as of public entities as well. Our issue is how do we fix them all. Great. Thanks, Donald. Um, we're going to get to your questions here in just a minute. Um, Don Cooper from uh, NHA, I was wondering, do you, do you want to take maybe two minutes and just, is there anything you'd want to respond to? I know um, you got to go first, so I don't know if you want, if there's anything you want to respond to. No, hey, thanks for the opportunity and happy to leave as much time for questions as we can. Uh, you know, ultimately, I just echo what Donald said at the end. That, that, there, that, that there are great operators of all sorts. Uh, there's great for-profits, great non-profits, great independently operated. Uh, you know, ultimately our shared goal should be how do we open up more great schools for kids? And as we see it, there are great actors in all sectors. And really the policy question is how do we encourage that replication of greatness across, across all of it to best serve our students? Can I get one more in then? <laughs> it's Donald. Go ahead. So, uh, and you may be right, Don, but I'm not sure the goal is to open up more great schools because I don't. You may be right because you may know the numbers and I don't. But it may be, you know, there's, you know, Chicago just closed 50 schools or something like that, and other places or Philadelphia is looking at closing schools. I would just rephrase it to say, how do we create, you know, that make all schools great, not close, not necessarily create new ones, but actually make sure that every, because we want every kid, no matter where they are. To get a good school, so that's the only thing I would say, and I would, you know, that's a good. I'll start Googling later today. Great, and th thanks for that clarification as well. Appreciate that. Great. All right. Well, we're going to get to. Uh, we have a couple questions that have come in. Um, the first one I think is going to be directed to you, Donald. Uh, the question is uh, about the website cashing in on kids. Um, mm -hmm. Is is that the question? Is is it funded by uh, teachers' unions at all? Well, it's a partnership between us and the American Federation of Teachers. So they pay their part and I pay my part. It's a project. It's a joint project. We we like to work with teachers. Um, okay, and the next one I think could be, I guess, for both of you. Um, and the question is regarding the issue uh, with for-profits not wanting to provide information to the charter school boards or government officials. Can't the authorizers make it a condition of approval that access to those records be accessible to inspection by at least uh, by at least independent auditors? Um, and similarly, can't those provisions and expectations be built into the charter management agreement? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it'd be better if they're in the law because then everyone's got to do it. Your level playing field. But, yeah. Don, what is Don? What is your response to the this? Yeah. Uh, idea of, of how much information the management organization should be sharing um, with either the, the state or with the charter school board, um, with the authorizer? Sure. Uh, fundamentally, charter schools are public schools, and uh, our practice at NHA is we report information consistent with how other public schools do so. So, uh, you know, our boards who hire us uh, receive uh, information, you know, they approve our budgets, we're bound by that. Uh, they receive periodic financial updates with a level of detail in it to direct how, to, to understand how funding is uh, is uh, is being spent. Uh, our schools are subject to Freedom of Information Act requests. 
uh, you know, we, we, we work to be in a transparent way. But to answer uh, Beth's question directly, uh, yeah, there are some mechanisms that authorizing bodies can use uh, to, to uh, you know, if they feel that, that provisions in state law or practices just, just aren't sound enough. Great, thank you. Uh, and one more question we have, um, and I, I imagine this is probably more directed towards Donald. <clears throat> Uh, but the question basically says that, you know, the, the public school system hasn't really been serving poor minority students all that well historically. Um, why is it in, not in the public interest, uh, or, sorry, let me read the question right. Why is it in the public interest to keep the private sector away uh, from helping solve these problems? Um, so basically, isn't it in the public interest to, to seek any um, alternatives or options or better solutions if, if it means reaching out to the private sector? Um, you know, in the abstract, no, there's no, I, uh, yes, of course you should do that. That's in the abstract, though. But once you get to the level of, okay, let's talk about what that really means, the things that I mentioned earlier, when you have an incentive structure, I mean, some of the things I didn't mention earlier, again, we've seen cases, which doesn't mean everybody does this, where um, folks scream, you know, where where uh, the you know for profits make it more difficult for people, you know, young children with disabilities or from low income communities that have higher poverty levels, that have lower educational attainment scores, and all that. They make you know they have they have ways that have, have made it more difficult to for those kids to get in and to exclude exclude that. So that becomes in the structure of how things are set up. Because they're, you know, again, I'm not against profit in, in general. This is a free, you know, we, we live in a, a capitalist system. That's all good. But that's what really happens when you put a for-profit entity uh, in charge of the school that is looking at cutting corners or making sure, because they're thinking about their bottom, they need to make sure that the schools are good, but they also need to make sure that their bottom line and their rate of return is adequate. So we should look, at, we should be looking to innovate in every possible way. But but it all comes down. It's not so much who, it's how. Oh, you know, you want transparency. You want to know how every dollar is being spent. Is it spent in the classroom for your kid in a in a lower income community, or is it spent, you know, on TV ads? You'd want to know that, and you want to be able to make your judgment and be able to tell the school or the school board or the authorizer they're spending too much money in, in ads. They need to spend more money in my kid's classroom. Um, you know, on the issue of transparency, you need to make sure that there aren't land deals where, you know, the 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 land and the lease is also owned by the same company, um, is also you know owned by a company, a, a, a related company, where the land prices, the rental prices are too high. I mean, these are things that happen. I I, I am not going to make a claim that they are the, the standard, but they do happen. So the issue is transparency. The issue is legitimacy. The issue is oversight. The issue is standards, not you know. And then the question is, who runs it? It's, it's, you know, anybody should be able to run it if they can live up to all that. John, did you have any comments on that? You, you know, ultimately, just back to the core of the question. Uh, kind of gets back to you know our our, our, sh our shared vision that that this is about creating more great schools for kids or or or, or making sure let me rephrase that or, or making sure that all students have an option to 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 go to go to a great school um, you know at the core of it we believe in choice we believe in parental choice and uh, we believe that that we can work together in various ways to to make sure that uh, to do a better job at making sure that parents have access to great schools. Uh, Authorizing bodies are right to ask certain core questions uh, for oversight of schools. Uh, when I was at Central Michigan University, the three core questions that we would ask when we were making authorizing decisions was first and foremost, what is the academic results you're achieving for kids? Um, the second was always centered around, you know, is the school operating in a solid financial state? You know, is it not in deficit? Um, you know, is everything in proper order? And then lastly, are we operating in good faith with the spirit of the charter contract and law? Uh, I think that's a pretty good test as to whether or not an operator of any sort or an independently operated school of any sort has earned the right to replicate throughout and serve more students. Uh, and through that, we can multiply our choices for kids and we can 
uh, work to bring in uh, actors from various sectors, the private sector and others, to really help with our shared goal of, of, more, uh, of improving the quality of education for everyone. Great. Um, one point was brought up uh, that I think is probably worthy of discussion, and that's the fact that um, whether it's a nonprofit CMO or a for-profit one, um, a lot of times they're charging a flat fee to the school. So as far as the cost to the public uh, and the cost to the school, it, it doesn't necessarily matter um, whether it's a for-profit or non-profit, and then it's just a matter of what that organization does with those that money um, on their end, which they're a private entity, so um, they have a lot of flexibility there. Uh, do you have any comments? Either of you have any comments on that point? Well, I, um, I mean, I think a lot of them are not flat fee. They're not, I think isn't it Michigan where it's maybe it's Ohio where it's you know the, I think Ohio the the, the uh, CMO can get up to ninety five or ninety six percent of the of the dollars and, the, and then all the federal money. You, you may know better than I do on that. Yeah. So, but to the, but to your point is, you know, that's the second part of your question. Then let me hand it off to Don. Is no, they shouldn't be able to spend it any way they want. It's yeah. public dollars. And ultimately, back to earlier comments, uh, in, in our model, the school boards that we work with approve a budget. So it's very transparent up front as to uh, what resources are being allocated, uh, in, into what areas. It's under board guidance. Uh, and their approval, we're bound by it. Um, and the, the amount that's charged is a management fee, if you will, or for services, uh, for us to provide the back end support uh, for our partner schools. I mean, that's incumbent upon us to, to, to manage, uh, all with the goal of, again, getting results for kids, because that's ultimately what, what matters in this. Okay, one question that has come in, and I, I think this will be direct towards Don. Uh, and you can talk about, I don't know if you can talk about other um, uh, management organizations, but at least for NHA, how, how are your schools performing? Are they performing well? Are they, you know, what is what does their performance record look like? Uh, sure. Thanks for the opportunity on that. Uh, you know, over our 20-year history, we've had a great track record. Uh, in the last academic year, our schools, our partner schools, uh, outperformed the local districts in which we operate in. Uh, about 75% of the time in the core academic areas of reading and math. Uh, our, our history shows that students tend to come to us uh, two or three grade levels behind. We do a very good job at catching them up in core areas. Uh, in one very core area for us is uh, charter renewal. Uh, as everyone on the call knows, charters operate under fixed term contracts with authorizing bodies. Uh, if we're not meeting the goals established in our charter contract, uh, at the end of the period, uh, the school can be closed. Uh, throughout our 20-year history, we've opened, uh, we've been involved in the opening of 81 schools. Uh, today, we currently manage 80 schools. So throughout our history, only one school's been closed uh, for academic reasons, and that level of accountability drove change within the entire organization. That's resulted in a, in, in a, in a better network for kids. Uh, because of that and because of our balanced growth pattern that we have, we, uh, we, always, we always keep that first and foremost, is what is, what is our student success uh, in both the short term and the long term. Great. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Uh, let's see if we have any other questions coming in. Um, let me just read this real quick. Um, so the question is referenced to um, a point made earlier about uh, for-profit charters making it more difficult for um, underperform underperforming students to enroll. Um, are there any examples of this that could be cited, um, and how can this be prevented in a public charter school? Yeah, no, you know, I, I mentioned it, and I don't have any off the top of my head because I read lots of reports on it, but I would be happy to send you, Josh, a couple of things that I've seen, because I just asked my research team, my research director, who will have it at her fingertips. Um, uh, you know, there's just different tactics and, and ways, so, but I can't bring up and suggest an idea in my mind. But I'm happy, why don't I email you, Josh, either later today or tomorrow, and then maybe you, you have a way to get a hold of the folks that are making the call. 
And or they can email, email me direct, or they can email me directly if you want me to give my email address. What would you prefer? Um, either way, we'll have uh, our webpage will have the uh, materials, so we can always put it up there too, or links to those things okay. on the website. Well, I'm pretty Googleable, so just Donald in the public interest if someone wants to email me directly. But I will get some information to you, Josh, in the next days. Great. Um, one question that is an important area to protect. It really is. You want to make sure that everybody gets the same shot. Um, one question that's coming is: How do uh, nationwide for-profit charter networks ensure that they are responsive, responsive to local issues and local needs? Don, I think that's probably for you. Sure. Yeah. Happy to take a take a shot at answering that. Uh, again, each of the schools that we manage is uh, governed by a locally uh, a, a local charter school board. Uh, that board enters into a contract with NHA, holds us accountable for results. Uh, you know, we uh, we're responsive to that board. Uh, they meet just like any other school board does. Uh, they they provide direction and guidance toward our operations. Uh, they um, you know, if there are local issues that we uh, that that we uh, may need a better way of understanding, uh, they help provide instruction and guidance in that. Uh, we also make a very uh, uh, co conscious effort, concerted effort, uh, that uh, that when that when we uh, when when we uh, when we are looking for uh, staff uh, to uh, help lead a school or teach in a school, that we look for those who are who who are local or from the area uh, to help uh, preserve that community integrity. Uh, ultimately, we want to be a school for the community and not just a school in the community. So those sorts of partnerships help in that. Uh, we also participate in things like boys and girls clubs, after school programs, open up school buildings so that they can be used by community groups. Uh, all of our schools have dedicated parent rooms that can be accessed by parents at any point in time uh, for, you know, whether it's to have a cup of coffee as they're volunteering in the school, or for pick up and drop off to socialize with other parents, or to hold meetings after school. Uh, in some of our urban areas, those rooms are used perhaps for internet access, as mom and dad might be studying for uh, for skills of their own. Um, but again, that's just another way of how we invite that local community in and really help shape the local program in each of our schools. Um, one question uh, we have that uh, perhaps I can address is, um, what are some of the common measures used to gauge success of a charter school, particularly in comparing them to public schools? Uh, and you know, I, I look at a lot of these research studies and, and read them and, and analyze them. And um, you know, you can you can use a lot of the same measures that you use to to gauge the performance of a, of a neighborhood public school. Uh, you know, they all have to take the state assessments, so you can look at test scores there. You can look at graduation rates if it's a high school. Um, you can look at attendance. You can look at um, a number of different factors. Um, one way that uh, a lot of researchers use to compare charters to public schools um, and what is considered kind of the, the gold standard um, would be a charter school that uh, is using a lottery for enrollment. So it's, it's randomly selecting uh, applicants uh, to fill its seats. So you can then compare uh, those students who get accepted to the charter school to those who applied but did not get picked in the lottery. Uh, and track those students as they go back to their their neighborhood schools or on to a different public school. And so if, if you can go compare those two students, assuming that essentially they have similar uh, motivations to, to go to the charter school, it just happens to be that, that some got in and some did not, um, then you can use that as a way to compare the students and account for some of the factors that um, might get in the way otherwise. Um, so so that's usually the, the biggest way that, that uh, the, the schools are compared. Um, there's other uh, studies that, that strictly look at things like test scores, just comparing um, uh, test scores straight across. Um, and so that's one way to do it. But there's a lot of caveats that, that, uh, that come into play there. And so you def definitely have to, to look at those studies a little bit closer um, to see what, uh, what kind of methodologies they're using to select their students or their schools. Um, all right, let me see if we have any other questions. And we have one question that says, charters originated as a place to try out new and specific educational alternatives to traditional public schools. Do CMOs offer something unique with respect to uh, traditional public schools? Um, in other words, are, are they kind of uh, 
are they, is that kind of their purpose is again to provide an alternative or um, are they kind of, does, does the idea of a CMO in a large network of schools kind of defeat the original idea that charter schools are supposed to be a laboratory of innovation? I think so. Yeah, either one of you can, Don, if you want. <laughs> Sure, absolutely. One of the advantages of uh, managing a network of 80 schools is that as, as we do uh, work on things locally and try things locally, uh, you know, we have the ability to innovate at individual sites, see what works, and then replicate it out across a network uh, to, to uh, get, get results for the similar po student populations in different areas. Um, so it does kind of provide us with a platform for both to, to innovate in some ways, see what works well, uh, and then also to provide that replication across. Yeah, to the, you know, it's sort of to the question, but also kind of a little bit to the earlier question is, remember that all this is public money, so money that's being shifted to a charter is being shifted out of a community school, of a neighborhood school. And so, you know, and it, again, it's something you just have to be careful of. Theoretically, it follows the student. And so that shouldn't be a problem, but we know it, but it's not that simple because there's overhead costs and maintenance and all of that. And so, um, you know, to the, you know, as as um, locuses of innovation and experimentation, as the questioner mentioned, that's great. But as we begin to shift, you know, as the growth rate, you know, accelerates charters, we really are seeing a defunding of neighborhood schools. We're still most kids go most kids go to school. So we're, you know, we're creating a parallel system. As a different, as as opposed to, you know, uh, sites of innovation. Excellent. Well, uh, I think we're about out of time, so I wanted to uh, thank both uh, Don Cooper from National Heritage Academies and Donald Cohen from In the Public Interest um, for joining us today and providing their experiences and knowledge and sharing that with us. Um, and also, thanks to everyone who joined in and listened in. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you have a great day. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thanks for the Thank opportunity. You.